everybody and uh, welcome to uh, this third in the series of Let's Talk About the Elections of 2024. Um, on behalf of the Jesuit Institute, I would like to thank Joanne Joseph for joining us this evening and Father Peter John Pearson uh, from Cape Town. Um, so Father Peter John and, and Father Russell will be having a conversation and Joanne will be mediating. I think that's the, how they're planning it. And um, if anybody would like to, to join in, please feel free to put uh, any um, comments or questions in the chat, and I'll pass them through to Joanne, who, who will then direct them to Peter and Peter John and Russell. So welcome, and um, I hope that we have a very fruitful discussion this evening. Thank you. Ashley, thank you very much for that. And good evening and welcome to everyone who's joined us today for this discussion on the role of the church and faith in our political dispensation, especially in relation to the imminent election. Uh, now, this is a discussion that I think is going to be very relevant to Christians, quite obviously, on the surface. But I also think there'll be many people out there who perhaps belong to other faiths, might even be atheist, and are interested to listen to the kind of ideologies and the kind of theories that are put forward the ideas that are put forward by, by the two gentlemen I'm going to be interviewing. So everyone is welcome. And uh, we would love to hear from you. The format that we're adopting is, I'll do this short introduction. Um, we'll get into the discussion with uh, Father Russell Pollitt and, and Father Peter John. And uh, thereafter, there we will welcome your questions as well. So please feel free to use the chat function. And as Ursula said, she will be sending the questions through to me. I'll do my best to get through as many of those as possible. Uh, you may have been uh, been privy to this article in the conversation, Dion Forster writing there recently and reminding us of two important facts, among others. Firstly, South Africa is one of only three countries in the world where religious participation has grown in recent years. Secondly, the most recent census, the census of 2022, shows that more than 83% of South Africans are Christian. So what does this mean as we move towards the 29th of May election? Should being Christian influence whether you vote in the first place, how you vote if you decide to, or do you simply compartmentalize those issues? Do you say spirituality is one issue and politics is a different issue entirely and the two should simply not meet? Well, today's discussion is in no way aimed at dictating who you should vote for. I want to be very clear on that. But it is aimed at stimulating your thinking around what your responsibility may be when the ballot comes around and offer you some relevant considerations as you prepare to cast your vote. Uh, so joining us once again, let me just uh, remind you of our guests, Director of the Jesuit Institute, Father Russell Pollitt. His organization has been hosting these election dialogues, and I'm very happy to be a part of this third one. And Director of the Catholic Parliamentary Liaison Office, Father Peter John Pearson joins us from Cape Town. Lovely to have you with us as well, um, Peter John. I've been given permission, by the way, to call them by their first names. I'm not being disrespectful to the priests, but it really is lovely to have all of you joining us online, and I hope you will be participating in our discussion as well. So, Peter John, I want to start with you. Um, you know, I had a phone call from a relative yesterday who, who considers herself a very committed Christian, but said to me, our family's not voting because nothing changes. Do Christians have any obligation to vote? Just unmute yourself, please, Peter John. Thank you. If one looks at recent um, thinking, um, especially in the traditional religions, I think we've come to a very um, obvious conclusion that Christians have the responsibility to participate across the spectrum um, of activities that promote um, social justice, that um, enhance the common good. Um, so we encouraged, and in fact, there's an obligation not only uh, to participate in the, uh, you know, five yearly um, uh, uh, ballot um, exercise, but to participate in civil society, to participate in any activity that um, draws us to places of leverage where we can make a change. Um, and we will do it in different ways. Some people are positioned in places where they can speak directly uh, to those uh, who are elected or those who make boardroom decisions. Uh, some people will do it through enhancing 
um, activity and strengthening action on the ground, but we all have this obligation to do it. In the Catholic community, um, there's a, a, a well-known document which was issued in 1985 by the International Theological Commission at the request of uh, Pope John Paul II. And he was asking, um, raising the question, what is it that is so important that we um, that we commit ourselves to social action, including voting. And the response came that it was to ensure that the possibilities always remained open for participation in political and social and economic life, that freedom and, you know, he was asking in 85, but it was fresh off the backs of um, various struggles um, um, around the world to um, escape the um, the horrors of um, the colonial pasts and so forth, um, and um, and uh, justice, so that there would be um, all those important aspects of, of, of justice, distributive justice, social justice, um, and uh, to enhance those things that we participated in political activity, including voting. So I think, you know, just the long scriptural tradition, the long patristic tradition, the traditions um, of the wise leaders all point to us having the responsibility to make heaven on earth and not to expect it to just fall into place later. So for me, it's a very clear, unambiguous, um, we have to vote. Um, we have to participate in rebuilding our country. Now, the nuanced question, I suppose, um, is can we do it when we are not sure that any one party carries our personal vision, values, and so forth? But that's another I'm, question. I'm I'm, I, exactly, exactly. I'm going to stop you there because I want to come to that in, in a moment. Um, and, and I was reflecting on that Kairos document you were talking about yesterday, going through it. And I mean, it's a very powerful, very persuasive document. And yet, Russell, we know voting is so often uh, influenced by identity politics. Uh, we, we know, and, and, and that applies to religious politics as well. Um, and, and the church is not a homogenous body. The church comprises many different denominations, many different variations in beliefs. And, and I was reading a, a Ponzo Pilane's book, Power and Faith. And, and she's pointed out, I mean, she points to our past and she, she points particularly to the churches during apartheid uh, that that failed to act morally because they simply believed in a very strict division between religion and politics. And, and they believed that to participate in politics at the time was, was a kind of worldly uh, bordering on evil exercise. Has that attitude changed across the board uh, in, in the Christian faith? Or, or would you say there are still churches that are reluctant for their congregants to participate in an election like the one coming up? Thanks, Joe. I think um, <clears throat> I think that that was the case for certain sections of the church. Uh, you know, if one looks back, um, I think that uh, very often, most especially in uh, the parts of the church where uh, the the people who were in power at the time, it was advantageous for them to say, "Well, this is not something that we talk about. This is not something." Uh, that uh, you know, we don't mix religion and politics, uh, as as people put it. I think there has, I think there certainly has been a shift, but I, I would also know many Christian communities today uh, that would maybe uh, still go with that and say, well, yeah, we talk about uh, Jesus and outside you go and do that stuff, which is of lesser value. Um, but I don't think that's the case with many of the mainline churches. Um, I think that, you know, that, that kind of split spirituality, I think, which Peter John was getting at as well, that split spirituality where we are, I have my social life, my uh, my uh, perhaps uh, 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 family life, my 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 work life in boxes is is certainly not uh, what we would advocate today. And we would say, look, we we're looking at a much more integrated approach. That my faith should be saying something about my family life, my social life, and also my involvement in uh, civil society. Uh, that you know, it's 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 a much more uh, integrated approach, and we can't split these things off. 
In actual fact, if one looks very carefully, uh, Jesus himself, who, you know, uh, is, is, uh, is uh, for us uh, the foundation of our faith, he participated in the political life of his society. And it is precisely because he had things to say to the political establishment of the time that he got himself um, uh, into trouble. So uh, there, I, there is no, we cannot have a faith that does not participate would be my uh, conviction in, in civil life, in fact, in all parts of human life. You know, Peter John, you, you raised that important point right. earlier, and let's get back to that now, because there are many Christians and there are people of many other faith-based organizations who might say, there isn't a political party that reflects my values, and that is the reason I won't vote. Is that a reasonable response? Look, I think it's a very common response. Um, I think we um, live in a, in a society and um, and we live in a particular era where um, if you can't get the whole package, we are not, um, we don't have, or we've lost the skills to unpack things and be able to um, have a more... Um, not an integrated approach, but to see things um, in in ways that you have to take it stage by stage. Um, there's when Pope Benedict was before he was Pope and um, was acting as head of a of a dicastery, um, he was responding to the to the you know the question the preeminent question for many people in their voting, and that is around of uh, the termination of of life um, abortion. And so forth. And he was saying that um, sometimes when you don't have a party um, that speaks directly and unambiguously um, about something like abortion, um, you've got to look at how you can engage that um, sort of almost incrementally um, and, you know, say, well, where in thinking through this issue uh, can I cause the least harm? Um, where is there space for me to be most proactive? So I suppose taking the cue from there, um, we can say that there is a legitimacy to um, saying that I would love to vote for a, a party that, um, that, that ticks all my boxes. Um, but maybe... I need to think of it in a broader term. Maybe I know that I can't get that one preeminent issue um, uh, dealt with comprehensively, but there are other issues around that, or there is room to nuance that position, and therefore I will find I'm most able to vote for a party that even while it might have it on its, um, or that or any other issue on their um, mandate, I. I can still find enough other issues um, that are um, important to vote for. And so I think people also struggle and conversations like these are hopefully aimed at helping people to work through those struggles and come to some kind of a position where they can say, this party actually ticks the most boxes, if not all. Um, so, so yes, I think, um, you know, that there isn't going to be a party that um, meets everyone's value system and expresses it um, comprehensively. But that isn't to deter us uh, from voting and for giving our cross to parties that do actually cater for lots of those other issues that are important to us. Russell, I think, uh, you know, probably one of the things that religion and politics have most in common is this issue of emotionalism. Um, uh, what do they say when, when you're having a, a debate with someone or a, a, a lunch with someone? One, one of the things you should not talk is politics and the other thing is religion. And I suppose that's because people have very emotional responses to both. Do Christians and indeed all South Africans at this stage need to take take a step away from the emotion of politics and take a more objective stance, a more intellectual stance, perhaps, whatever that may be? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, Joe, that there is uh, very often this emotional component. I mean, if you just think of South Africa's uh, uh, politics, I mean, we are largely... Uh, uh, 
there's a racial politics at play, and there's a lot of emotion around that. I mean, you know, one just looks at what's happening in the in the political arena. And I think that's a very important thing. I think for people to step back and to say, first of all, let me get in touch with the values that are most important for me. Um, because it's all very well to look at what's on offer, but you know, we have to have a sense of what it is that that I desire. What are what are my core values? What are my core values? And then I think as well, another, another component to that is to say, okay, with, with these core values, what is the kind of leadership I would like to see in place now? Because the problem is we, we get emotional and we get so fixated on a specific person or a specific party that I think very often we're not in touch with maybe what it is I value, what is important for me, and what kind of leadership this country needs at the moment. So that idea of stepping back and getting in touch with that I think is is, uh, is uh, very important. And then I think another thing to do is to uh, politicians talk a lot when they, when an election is is close uh, we, uh, you know closing in on you. I mean we see that all over the world. And I think that very often it is important when I say okay I think this party or that person may hold some uh, of these values or a lot of the values that are important to me is to go and actually read about it. Because very often the small print or the things that may be uh, I, I, that, that are not necessarily said are the important things to, to look at. So, for example, Peter John spoke there about, you know, the question of abortion. So uh, a lot of Christians react very emotionally to that question straight away. Uh, then when you go and read things like, for example, the ACDP, as, a, as, a, as an example, have on their manifesto, you know, that there won't be abortion. But you read further down, you know, for them, the death penalty is something important. You say to yourself, well, OK, I'm not hearing that. I, I you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily hearing that in the public domain. So I think research is quite important as well. And I often think we as voters are very lazy. We don't do that. We listen to what people are saying in the media. We attach emotionally to something or someone or some idea. And that's the end of the story. Let's also go and do our own research about what is on offer and what these parties are saying. And let's be very aware of that tendency to maybe go with emotion uh, simply because it's good for my group or, you know, there, there is something there that is specifically uh, important for me. Let's find out a little bit more. Let's step back. I love that because it, it gives you the distance that that's required to make a more um, a more objective decision if if objectivity is is possible. Peter John, I want to pick up on that though because you raised the issue of abortion earlier. Russell has mentioned it again, and and I think it it signals a tendency amongst certain churches to highlight particular issues um, that become quite populist in terms of how churches. Let's be quite honest market themselves, right? Um, so they highlight a, a particular doctrine like um, same-sex unions, or they they highlight abortion. And, and this becomes this becomes quite uh, quite an important stance for the church. And it may similarly, in a parallel fashion, become quite an important stance for a political party. When we are assessing how it is we're going to vote and how we look at issues, do we have a tendency, do you think, as an electorate to simply focus on those issues that have been highlighted for us because they're constantly being fed to us week after week or month after month in our religious space? Or are there other important issues that are really pivotal for the country but are not getting the same amount of airtime that, that religious organizations should actually be giving them? Yes, I think that's, that's a critical question. Um, my initial response is that, you know, um, often those who lead the conversation determine the kind of um, descriptors. And so that be, they decide what issue is going to uh, become the key issue um, and the, in defense, the defensible issue. Um, and I think we need, that's a space we need to open up because, um, there is again, I mean, in the Catholic world, there was a very important document from Pope Francis um, in which he speaks um, um, about there being many issues that have to be taken together if, for instance, the principle of life is going to be 
um, highlighted and preserved. He speaks and mentions um, migration, refugees, um, economic um, um, economic uh, situations where people are deprived, the environment, all of these things are, are, are life-giving and all of these things, if they are um, in any way um, detrimental uh, or dealt with detrimentally, they would end life. Um, so I think we are appealing for an holistic picture. Not saying that any of the issues that have um, had all the airtime are, 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 are not important, but they are equally, or they need to be read alongside other, um, other, other issues as well. Um, the, so, so I'm all for developing a larger, more comprehensive um, uh, understanding of life and of, um, you know, giving. Um, I, I vote to people who are also taught, taking seriously the future of this planet, who are taking seriously um, the plight of um, 80 million refugees across the face of the earth, who are taking seriously um, the wars and the uh, genocide and, um, and all of those, because they belong to the same defense of life. And um, we've got to give them um, equal um, space in our thinking and ensure that our voting is also an encouragement for those we put in power to um, emphasize those issues as being all of them important. Um, and they do sit together. You know, there's a, there's a very powerful line in the writings of the American theologian, David Tracy. Um, and he speaks about um, the outward expressions of our inward beliefs and asks us to understand that we believe certain things um, as personal, private, privately held beliefs. Um, you know, we believe in a God who is um, three persons. And he asks us to look at those and say, what do those mean publicly? What does that privately held belief mean publicly? Uh, and the answer he gives to, to, the, to the example I've raised is he said, well, for one, it raises the question of um, equality. Um, we are told in our catechism that the three persons in the Godhead are equal. Um, and so it raises the question of equality. It raises the question then of human rights. Um, and if a um, party has scant regard for that, writes off migrants and says, you know, we'll beat them up and send them home, um, then that is equally um, dangerous to the protection and the preservation of life. Mm. Uh, uh, Russell, what, what for you are the issues that tend to get brushed under the carpet when faith-based faith organizations are imparting doctrine to their congregants? I think in our own context here, uh, I think, for example, you know, it's amazing that sometimes we want to have conversations about things like, for example, uh, you know, which has come up now already a few times, abortion or homosexuality or whatever the case is, when, you know, we, we, live, in, we live in a context of dire poverty, you know, and, and I, I just wonder how often uh, that is actually addressed, you know, uh, when we live in a situation where uh, you know people have very limited access to healthcare, when we live in a situation because that's a life and death matter, you know we know that. I mean, you go to some hospital, you go down the road from where I'm living to Helen Joseph Hospital, and you just see what's happening there. I went not so long ago to what uh, Charlotte Mateke, the old uh, Johannesburg General Hospital. Uh, you know, where sheets are dirty with blood stains on, drips are hanging on coat hangers. I mean, that's a life issue. That's a life issue. You know, you think of children who are, uh, you know, uh, falling into pit latrines. In 2024, we are still struggling against the question of pit latrines. You think, for example, of the corruption in the private sector. Uh, and you think of, you know, uh, the deals that are done, uh, how uh, people are paid unimaginable salaries, while some people 
can't find food for, for, for the next day for their children. I mean, it seems to me those issues are, are very important issues that we should be uh, addressing, you know. And so from a faith-based uh, perspective, I often, I often feel very uncomfortable with the fact that when we do speak about elections, when we do speak about moral choices in elections, these issues are not always highlighted in the way that they should be. And I think Pope Francis is absolutely right. I mean, he's spoken to the American church about this. I think this idea of having a preeminent issue when it comes to voting is a very bad way of doing it. I think that, you know, morality needs to be a seamless garment. And therefore, the person who's living on the streets should be given just as much attention as some of the other issues, which we very quickly jump into and get emotional about. You know, on that note, um, I, I want to ask you about the, the rise of Christian nationalism, Russell, because we've seen this happening in other countries. The United States um, has had a great deal of influence on, on religion in our country, whether we'd like to admit it or not, over the decades. And, and we've seen how it's played out there. We've seen that taking Christian values into public spaces, like the Senate and other spaces, uh, often takes the form of exclusion and discrimination at the ballot box. And in terms of how people vote are on issues that intrude into people's private and intimate spaces. Is there anything Christian voters need to guard against in this domain in our country? I think so. I mean, I think that there is a, there is a you know, in some parts of, of, of the, the Christian landscape in this country, I mean, I think that there is, uh, you know, uh, an ongoing kind of narrative that uh, that suggests that you know uh, there should be this preeminent space given to uh, the uh, uh, you know the Christian faith and the role that it should play in politics. However, I do think in this country that we are not in the same uh, kind of boat, for example, as the U.S. I think if one just looks at uh, the way that uh, elections are conducted in this country, we we may even be completely to the other side that. Uh, you know, we have a constitution, we have an IEC, I mean, we, we've got pretty good regulations. And although we see politicians sometime, uh, sometimes, it seems to me, visiting churches around the time of, of elections and so forth, I, I think that, that for the most part, that sort of Christian nas nationalism is not something that is a big threat here uh, in, in, in South Africa, well, at least at the moment, and as we move towards this election. I was thinking the other day, we have seen politicians visit churches, um, but, I, but it was, it's interesting to me that I think this election, we've heard much less of that than what we heard in previous elections where, you know, uh, uh, every weekend there was a high ranking official visiting a church and asking for a blessing. We, we, haven't, we, we haven't seen as much as that this time around in, in, in what I've observed than what we did maybe five years ago. And I think that speaks to the fact that here we still are maybe holding that tension, that balance much better than what they are, for example, in the US. PJ, uh, Peter John, how do you feel about that? Um, I think we've seen it happen in the past. I have a feeling it's still coming, Russell, that um, in, in election week, we're going to see a lot more people go to church after a very long time to ask for an anointing from, from the various priests and pastors. And, uh, Peter John, how do you feel about churches that anoint political leaders and endorse them, and by extension, their parties? I, I mean, I just think it's such a cheap political trick. It's so expedient. It's, um, you know, it's just so um, threadbare <laughs> in its credibility. Um, and um, I think for me, what I find a little bit more worrying um, around that whole question you raised about um, the Christian nationalism is the subtle but consistent way um, churches are shaping their theology and their practice um, in ways that privilege individualism and exclusion. Um, and, you know, we just see it in um, discussions that are happening around um, around uh, the, the genocide in, in Gaza and, and the occupied West Bank, where um, Christian churches across 
a number of spaces, um, would say to you, well, this is what God said in favor of, and therefore everybody else needs to be excluded. We see it in the way um, the prosperity cults operate. And, you know, if you, um, not the community, are obedient, you will prosper. Um, so we're hearing um, a number of narratives that privilege individualism, that privilege um, wealth. And we gain to find that the, um, the consequence of that is that people will start looking for parties that privilege a group, um, that privilege um, race or, um, or, or religion um, over others and, um, and privilege acquisition um, and, and over others and therefore, um, you know, giving their vote to, to those kinds of groupings. So I think the process, as you suggested, Joe, is in, 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 in the, is in process though, because people are being drawn to that. And of course, it's always a temptation, especially for those who are very vulnerable in different ways, emotionally, psychologically, mentally, um, financially, economically, um, to seek solace in that which, even though you might not have much to show at the moment, privileges you as somebody, um, you know, who um, is worthy of special treatment. And so I think the, the danger for me of Christian nationalism is um, that danger of, of enhancing a private um, as opposed to public, personal, as opposed to community. Um, and, and that's a danger. And you often see parties look across Europe um, who hold that kind of view now growing in their support basis. You know, it's so Joe, interesting Joe, what you say. Yes, you want to add to that, Russell? So I, I, you know, and another angle of looking at this this question as well, I think, is to say, you know, when we do see churches kind of leaning towards uh, one uh, person or whatever, we, 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 we sort of move backwards into sort of medieval Europe where somehow the leader is divinely ordained. And it seems to me that's a massive uh, uh, difficulty when one is in a constitutional democracy. You know, uh, the, 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 you, 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 you have to choose. Are you going to have someone that's kind of divinely um, uh, being, uh, um, you know, uh, set apart for this role as the leader? Or are you going to go uh, with the constitutional democracy? And I think, and I think, you know, in South Africa, you know, if, we, if we're going to be a constitutional democracy, uh, the other one is excluded. The other point I want to make about that is churches that get too close to um, political parties, I think, threaten their own very existence. Why? Because I think the church should uh, be able to speak and critique what is happening, uh, especially in the organization of society, uh, from a distance. And so we lose a very important uh, uh, dimension of what it is to be church, and that is the prophetic. We cannot speak prophetically if we are to put it in a very crude way, in bed with certain political leaders. So you you, you reduce your own effectiveness, and in a sense, you uh, you undo your own mission, it seems to me, uh, if, if, if that's the way we're going to go. And I think, mm. of course, religion by its nature being so subjective um, often leads to a situation where our worldview, our perspectives, our actions are defined by this religious code we embrace. But of course, in South Africa, we're also living under this umbrella of this wonderful world-class constitution that, that actually values the greater good over perhaps more narrower interests, or narrower interests, I should say. I mean, is there a way that Christians can harmonize their beliefs with the values of the secular constitution, or is that an unreasonable ask, Peter John? No, I don't think at all. Um, I think values, and you know, there is an argument that uh, says that deep in the kind of, uh, well, I suppose I made it partly earlier in saying that values like equality values like the common good 
um, are in um, are inherent in our religious understanding. In our um, certainly in our case, in the Judeo-Christian kind of um, thinking, and what we see in um, in the Constitution are expressions of the same set of values. So, um, you know, I don't see a conflict. I see, I mean, I think part of the fact that it is so world-class is that um, it has drawn almost intuitively from the best of the faith traditions and thinking, refined, overhauled, um, looked at from other angles, but nonetheless with a kind of nexus to that past and um, has found expression in secular terms. And and I think that um, the labeling shouldn't obscure um, our, our, our gratitude to, to, to the very deep roots of those and we share in those roots. So I think it's wholly consistent to appreciate both. Hmm. Thank you for that, Peter John. I'm going to move towards the uh, the question time now with our, our audience because some beautiful questions are really coming through now. Um, and the first question that's been sent through, and I'm not quite sure who this is from, but um, this the question is: Is there any benefit in deliberately spoiling your vote as a no confidence vote? Russell, would you like to take that one? <laughs> I I. I'm not sure that that is a helpful way of, of, of uh, yeah, okay, we're saying I'm not confident, um, but is that really helpful in, in trying to get uh, people into place who could maybe uh, begin, even if it's just one or two voices, could maybe begin to enter into uh, the national dialogue from a different uh, uh, perspective or from a new perspective or, or something like that. Uh, the, uh, it was very funny. Somebody asked me this question the other day, and I and I felt something in me like really rebel against the saying. You know, I I really don't think that is a helpful way. And dare I even say it? It seems to me uh, that you know it is really uh, at, at odds with our civic duty if we look at it through the through the lens of faith to say you know that we are called to participate. And it may not be perfect, nothing in perfect, nothing is perfect, none of us is perfect. And yet the one opportunity we're given to participate, it seems every five years, uh, we choose not to participate. So I would not advocate that at all. I mean, I, I, I really think that uh, we, we can and should find ways, and hence the homework we need to do, I think, uh, about when we go to the polls, about who we might be putting a, a tick or a, a cross next to. I don't know. Peter John may have a different opinion to me. Peter John, what's your feeling on I that? I would dare to have a different opinion to you, Russell. <laughs> um, uh, look, I think um, in the scale of things, a deliberately uh, spoiled vote as a protest vote um, is not, is at least um, a conscious participation. It's saying this time round, I can't find anyone. I'm not in the list of independents or the um or, or the 35 parties that are participating. I can't find anyone, but I will not allow that to stifle um a vote um or participation. Um and I think there's something to be said for that. I think there's something to be said in um for that kind of vote in places where um, you have to vote um, and um, and can't vote. You know, I mean, I think that obligation is a much stronger one in places like Australia. But I do think there is another sense in which it takes away our political agency. Um, and therefore, I would be inclined with Russell to say, no, um, you know, outside of very specific um, protest um, um, uh, kind or campaigned responses through non-voting, I don't think that's um, a helpful way to engage, especially in threshold moments like we're going through. 
I think you make a very important point there because we had another of our viewers actually sending a question in while while you were responding to that, Peter John, saying, saying you know, isn't that a form of, of resistance? Um, but, but I think the context, as you've pointed out, is extremely important. And at this time in our history, that may not be the most, uh, the most helpful solution. Uh, another lovely question from Terence Creamer, who says, in some parts of the world, Catholics often prompted by their bishops are viewed as single issue voters. So that African Catholics have, to date, avoided this. Do you see this as a future trend or risk, Russell? Firstly, have Catholics actually avoided this in South Africa? I'm not sure. Mm. I think for the most part, uh, Catholics have. Um, if one just looks, for example, at past elections from 1994, uh, and even maybe when there were really strong voices in the bishops' conference that were uh, highlighting maybe one preeminent issue, uh, if you looked at what what happened in the at the at the ballot box, I'm not sure that it had a huge uh, uh, effect at all. Um, um, I think the South African bishops, you know, they can be critiqued perhaps for 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 a number of things, but I think generally the South African bishops have, uh, as a whole, the Bishops' Conference have always held a pretty good line uh, on voting, uh, where they've encouraged people, they've said, look, our job is to encourage you to vote, our job is to encourage you to get informed, uh, and then to go and vote. I can't think of ever any uh, uh, document or official uh, uh, statement coming out from the bishops to say that you have to vote in such a direction. I think our bishops have been uh, pretty good at saying, this is what we see, this is what we hope for. At the end of the day, you need to make up your mind. And with the current uh, leadership in the Catholic Church in this country, I really don't think they're going to take a stance uh, as bishops have in other parts of the world, where you almost feel bishops are, are really pushing people to vote in a certain direction. I've never got that sense that that's the case in this country. They have individual voices that have highlighted things that have been of concern to them. But for the most part, I think the bishops have been pretty balanced in what they've said. Uh, uh, Peter John, one for you, which I think is is quite an, an interesting and complex question, and this is from Sarah Lear Pimentel, who says, is it really possible to divorce a party's policy on hotbed issues or on a hotbed issue that is at odds with some aspects of social justice, but seems to offer positive ideas and perhaps even some positive track record on other social justice issues that are more bread and butter South Africans. If they lack internal coherence, can we really trust that they'll act according to the values they proclaim? I don't think we can ever give a guarantee that um, our trust will be repaid. Um, but I think the the direction of the question is right, that, um, you know, there are people there are these situations where things that are important to us are at odds. And I think it is one way of looking at it um, is to say, well, where is the track record on the bread and butter issues or where and how realizable are the promises on the bread and butter issues? And uh, to say, well, that at least offers hope for, for many people, um, because I think we've prefaced this discussion, um, we framed it in a way that says no political party, no independent candidate is going to be perfect. And we're going to have to make hard choices to move our country over the line. And that might be for the moment that we can't indulge in the kind of luxury voting of um, whatever the the preferred issue is um, because there's just a bigger historical task that needs to be accomplished at this point. Um, and therefore, we've got to find a way of working together on, as Russell said earlier, the um, issues around poverty, um, you know, put latrines, um, um, xenophobia, um, all of those are very critical issues. And so I think there is a kind of difficult but um, real kind of 
internal coherence that um, gives us the confidence to vote, even if imperfectly, because that inner coherence is there and holding things together for us. Um, an important comment here from uh, Dr. Betty Govenden. She says the church should be inclusive and practice and preach the principle of equality. And she, of course, was actually one of the signatories to that Kairos document you spoke of earlier, Peter John. Um, but but Terence, and I want to combine that with, with Terence's comment because I think it's very relevant. And, and Russell, you and I have had conversations about this where we want to, to tear our hair out. Um, the, he, uh, Terence says the Catholic church, uh, clergy and laity, and I, I would like to just extend this to a lot of other established churches as well uh, in South Africa, historically played a very important leadership role in focusing on justice and equality, but this seems lacking in our current context. The church seems to have retreated. How can we, as the, as the church, promote equality and justice within the constraints of a seemingly increasingly narrow doctrine-based church? Such an important question, and of course, particularly with the Catholic Church, it brings us back to all sorts of things, including the exclusion of women priests. Russell? Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a very good question and one that I often ponder. What happened after 1994? Because certainly, you know, one thinks back of figures like... Uh, 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 in the Catholic community, Dennis Hurley, or you think of Bayes Nordia, or you think of Desmond Tutu himself, uh, you know, and so many others, uh, Trevor Huddleston, so many others who seem to be at the forefront of the fight for justice. I, I guess a, a kind of lazy argument would say in one way that we, uh, when, when democracy came, uh, maybe people said, okay, we've kind of made, we've achieved what we wanted to achieve and, and sort of, uh, and step back. I, I'm not sure that's entirely true, but what I, what I, what I also think has happened in the last uh, 20 years, most especially within the Catholic Church, is that we've become so internally focused on many of the battles that are going on uh, doctrinally within the church that we have lost uh, uh, that critical engagement, uh, that prophetic voice uh, uh, in society. Uh, and dare I say it, because people get very uncomfortable, I think as well that uh, the church has been really uh, morally challenged uh, to deal with a number of issues be because, for example, of the massive child abuse scandal, which broke in the early 2000s as well. And I think this, this has played a role as well in, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, you know, muting the voice uh, of the church. However, you know, if one looks in the last 10 years, we have had a pope in place who has been very willing to once again engage on a number of these social issues. Uh, for the uh, Peter John has already mentioned things like uh, migration, uh, but the Pope has engaged on a number of these societal issues and been quite prophetic in a number of spaces. And it seems to me he's opened the door for us to walk back into that social activism sort of space, but very few people have moved through that door. Uh, very, few, very few people have chosen uh, maybe to, to engage uh, with, with a number of, of these issues. Uh, yeah, and, you know, the issue of, of like, uh, you know, women in the church. I mean, at the moment, for example, the Catholic Church is in this process of a synod. One of the things that is being spoken about is the role of women in ministry. Once again, Pope Francis has put this uh, on, on, the, uh, on the agenda because I think he does realize that what's going on inside the church also has to be a, you know, a reflection of, of where we are uh, in, uh, in society. And uh, this is, is an important thing if we talk about equality that, that we, we cannot escape uh, uh, talking about. So I, think, I, think it's, I don't think there's a one-word uh, one answer. Um, I think the impact of COVID, for example, on church communities and the sort of having to almost reestablish themselves also, churches took a big hit because of that, and uh, you know the the internal stuff uh, became much more the focus maybe than what's going on outside of society. Um, but I don't I don't think that excuses it, and I think the question still needs to be answered: why uh, we have stepped back, uh, it seems, from some of these critical issues, and why, for example, the voice of the church, even in our own country, you quoted statistics at the beginning of this that said how the Christian kind of community in this country was growing, and yet the voice of the church seems to be more and more marginal 
uh, when it comes to a lot of these social justice issues. Uh, because what we're not getting media time, or we're simply just not saying anything about these uh, these issues for for one reason or another. Yeah, and I, I wonder, Russell, Jill, if yeah, yes, Peter John. I I wonder if part of it um, is that in the sixties, both in the period of um, of independence for many countries far back as the 1940s for for perhaps um, India and Southeast Asia. But, um, you know, the the social ills were fairly obvious and well-defined. Independence, um, you know, Mm. universal suffrage, um, and, and, and those issues, and one could respond to them with a certain clarity. I think for a number of years, the issues and the struggles have been more diffuse. Um, we've not been able to name them with the same clarity and therefore perhaps have the same energy uh, to attack their consequences. Mm. I think we're moving into a period of tremendous uh, change now. It seems to me that one of the things that the... Um, that the genocide um, in Gaza has prompted has been an upsurge in um, anger, an upsurge in um, questioning how power is used and abused, um, an upsurge in in truth-telling. And all of those have not only been applied to Gaza, but people are talking about it in terms of the DRC, in terms of Sudan, in terms of, of, of a range of other conflict-ridden areas and applying the same rigorous analysis and condemnation to that. So it seems to me that we might be moving into an era where these things which might have been diffused um, and difficult to to kind of categorize are now... Um, been seen in a very obvious way and therefore, um, you know, demanding a very um, obvious skill, uh, a response, sorry. And um, and that might be, we might be at the beginning of a, another period of activism, um, including um, in, in our faith communities. Well, one would hope so, Peter John, and I'm very glad that you brought up the Palestine issue because I was going to raise that in a moment, but I'm getting to what I think may be my last question because we're running out of time here. Um, and, and this is a question from Smilong Gadi, uh, which I think is a brilliant question, but Palestine is a very, very good example of exactly this. Smilo says, often, if not always, churches and religious organizations are ideologically fragmented within themselves. Internally, each member emphasizes this or that value. The whole packaged church is a thing of the past. Thus, for a church to speak with one voice in political and social matters has become almost impossible. And Russell, I think you spoke there for a moment about the um, uh, about the the politics inside the church, right? So, so you were talking about the Catholic Church and and the the issues that you are are navigating as a church. But but we have a church community, a very divided uh, denominational uh, Christian community in South Africa that has very different views on certain issues. And Palestine is probably one of the best, most recent examples of that, where you know it's it's not a homogenous community. With, with the same values, the same ideas, the same approaches. Um, they will use the same Bible to come up with two entirely different conclusions on the same issue. Russell? Mm. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And I, I don't even think we have to look as far as Palestine. I mean, I think we just have to look at, uh, you know, the, 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 the Catholic Church in this country vis-a-vis, for example, the Dutch Reformed Church and how we were reading the scriptures very differently in the in the seventies and the eighties, uh, that was uh, that was very uh, that was very clear as well. No, I think Smilo is right. I think this idea that you know churches are uh, uh, sort of all uh, well within a church we're all thinking in the same is not true. And if you think about uh, this, is a very layered uh, question, which would be a very interesting discussion because. There is not just the question of the religious faith, but then you've got, you know, you've got people who are 
uh, Catholic, for example, who are English speaking, Afrikaans speaking, Zulu speaking, Sutu speaking. So you have another cultural layer there as well. Uh, and we know too that from the cultural perspective, uh, things are things can be uh, you know we we see things uh, uh, very differently. And so I think the idea that the church is acting or moving together in one uh, one way or one ideology is is a, is a dreamy thing. I agree with that. However, what I think the role of the church should be is not to uh, not to dictate to people the way that they should think or not to, uh, uh, you know, pontificate even the way that people should think. Our role is really, I think, uh, very much to help people to think the issues through and to help people to make informed choices by helping them, like we are trying to do in these dialogues, to uh, uh, think things through. And people will go away from here, for example, even if we are all part, for example, of the Catholic community, and still choose to do things very differently. But hopefully, we are helping people, uh, we are giving them uh, uh, material that can help them to navigate these complexities and to uh, think things through. The question of the interpretation of the scriptures, for example, uh, you know, and this is a very difficult thing. I mean, in some, in some church communities, we've got people that are well-versed, that have studied these texts and understand these texts well. In other communities, there may be uh, a question of taking these texts on face value. But, you know, scripture texts as well, I don't think we should just read them and say, okay, well, the Bible says this, therefore. We need to inform ourselves where that comes from. A very classic example, speaking about Palestine and, 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 and so forth, is this idea that, you know, Israel can do as they please simply because God gave them the land and the scripture says that. You know, a real good study of that would indicate that that's a very simplistic reading of what that text actually means. Uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a real complexity here, and I think that we should be creating spaces to help people think through the issues rather than thinking, okay, everyone's going to just vote off uh, 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 um, you know, a, a, a way that we say people should think. Uh, th those days are long gone where the church can tell people what to think. Russell Pollitt, Director of the Jesuit Institute, I want to thank you so much for your, your contribution to this and for hosting these dialogues, uh, which, which have, have rooted the church firmly in the secular life of the country as well, which I think is really important. Director of the Catholic Parliamentary Liaison Office, Father Peter John Pearson, sharing beautiful sure. thoughts um, from, from everything that he has studied, the documentation, um, having been part of the life of the church in the context uh, of a country with, with a very, very violent and difficult history like ours. Um, and, and both of you bringing these thoughts together so beautifully as you encourage people to go to the polls on the 29th of May. Now, I wonder if you are sitting at home or wherever you are and you watch this and you were determined you were not going to vote or you weren't too sure about what tools you needed to be able to decide who you were going to vote for. I'm really hoping that this conversation uh, has given you some of those tools to be able to make those decisions in a clearer way. Um, if you feel you're not there yet, watch it again <laughs> and, and, and try to glean. I, I certainly am going to do that before I vote. And, and, and I'd love to, to re-listen to what Peter, John and Russell have had to say to us today, because I think moving into this new era, which I believe it will be for our country, where a lot more is expected in terms of activism from the citizenry, the kind of advice that we've heard from them this evening and the commitment to building this country together is a very important thing for all faith-based organizations and even those who exist outside of that framework. So thank you so much for joining us for this evening. And I hope that this has been a useful discussion for you. Thank you to the Jesuit Institute for inviting me to moderate this discussion and to our two fantastic guests. And and uh, Ursula, I'm going to now hand back to you. Thank you very much. Um, Joanne, thank you very, very much for moderating that discussion. I think it was a, a really fruitful discussion. It's, it certainly made me do a lot of introspection as well. And I hope that everybody will go out and, and vote and that something positive will come out of this, this election. So I think we can just hope that, yeah, that there will be change. Um, I loved what Peter John said about this being a historical moment. I hadn't thought of it in those terms. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Peter John. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Joanne. Have a lovely evening, everybody. Mm -hmm.